It says it's a psalm for Solomon. We have uh, we have a song or psalm, <laughs> which is uh, kind of an inner uh, word that can go either way. Uh, of course, the book of the Bible is Psalm of Solomon. This is a psalm for Solomon, and uh, uh, many believe, of course, we know who the author is, but many believe the penman uh, is David. David writing here, uh, perhaps near the end of his life, and writing this uh, to uh, Solomon, or uh, even for uh, Solomon. And uh, some would say and, uh, that it was about Solomon, or perhaps uh, the thought is that uh, as David wrote this to Solomon, this is the kind of king, perhaps, that David uh, wanted Solomon to be. And of course, uh, that's impossible <laughs> for him to do that. Um, and uh, my mind instantly, as I studied this, my mind instantly went to Matthew chapter 12 and uh, verse 42, where Jesus said, the queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with his generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost part of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And here's what I uh, just thought of as I studied this this week. A greater than Solomon is here. And uh, although Solomon did not fulfill uh, this as king, uh, Solomon's, uh, greater than Solomon, the Lord Jesus Christ, did fulfill it and will uh, fulfill it. So um, I titled this uh, psalm, titled this message tonight, A Psalm for King Solomon. And Solomon's superior king. A psalm for King Solomon and Solomon's superior king. Why did I use the word superior? Because I'm looking for an S word uh, because Jesus said a greater than Solomon is here. And so really it is about uh, Solomon's, uh, the superior king. It's about the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And we'll get into uh, this and we'll read it here in just a second. But you think about all that uh, the Lord uh, wanted people to do, and uh, they failed at that, but the Lord Jesus Christ never fails. Uh, we'll talk about in these verses uh, tonight, uh, verse number eight talks about dominion. Think about God, how God uh, created Adam and gave him dominion, but Adam lost that, and uh, that was lost, but it was regained in the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, this is, of course, about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the king and uh, how he will rule and reign uh, on this earth. So let's read it together. I'll read it aloud. You read fall on, please, with me. It says, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people he shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also in him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. 
His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun. And men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. Perhaps I like to think about this psalm in this way, as this is a psalm for Solomon, saying to Solomon, hey, uh, let me tell you who the real king is, and he's coming. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, it's always good. We think about, we're talking about Solomon, and we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. King Solomon, King David, and of course the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give this to you by way of introduction. Uh, that it's always right to look beyond a person and on to Jesus. It's always right to look beyond a person and on to Jesus. Never fixate on a man. Always focus on God. Glance at men, but gaze at God. Amen. So let me give you a couple of thoughts here this evening. We're going to go verse by verse. We're just going to, of course, we have 20 verses and probably about 20 minutes. So we'll touch on each verse for just about a minute, and then I want to make some applications for us and some commitments that I want to make from this psalm and I want you to make from this psalm. In verses 1 through 4, we see the coming king. Verse number 1, notice he says, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. Now we believe here the king, again, is David. We believe the son here is Absalom. And it's interesting, the thought that I want to give us from verse number one is that David, of course, who was king, wanted Solomon to not only have the throne, but to have the right thoughts. Not only the throne, but the thoughts. Uh, you can say it this way, not only the position, but the right performance. You know, you ever see somebody that has a position, but just because they have a position, doesn't mean they're doing the right thing. Amen? Mm -hmm. And so um, <clears throat> I need to see that, right? Uh, start, Solomon, of course, he started off pretty good as a king, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Started off really good. His judgments were good. Of course, uh, we alluded to that, I believe, uh, men in the past, uh, past Sunday in, in Sunday school talking about Solomon's wisdom and how he, uh, that child was brought to him, that two, those two women fighting over whose baby that was. And God gave him wisdom to decipher that. Remember that? And his fame spread abroad because of the wisdom uh, that God gave him. What happened when he studied the life of Solomon? What happened? That, that judgment decayed over time. Only Jesus, think about this, only Jesus will judge in perfect righteousness and justice. Aren't you glad that his uh, righteous judgments will never wane over time? Uh, they will never lack over time. Jesus will never start off well and finish not well. No, he will finish start perfect. He will it'd be in the middle perfect, and he will finish in perfection. I'm thankful for that tonight, and that's what I'm thankful that's where our faith is in tonight. Now, notice in verse number two, and again, we're just going to touch each verse as we go through. He says in verse two, he shall judge thy people with righteousness. And notice these two words, thy poor, and thy poor with Judgment. I thought about this as I studied this verse today, that God has a special interest in the poor. When you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he said that, that the foxes uh, right have holes and the birds have nests. But nowhere did the Son of Man have a place to lay his head. Jesus knew what it was like, did he not, uh, to be poor. And uh, God had a special interest in the poor. Uh, I want us to think about this tonight. Neither capitalism or colonization or communism has ever totally met the needs of the poor. Amen. Now, there's support different programs that are better than others. I'll take capitalism over communism. Amen. Amen. I understand that. But none of them, none of them are perfect. Right. right. Only Lord Jesus Christ, when he rules and reigns on this earth, he will judge perfectly to the poor. He will give exactly meet the needs of the poor. Somebody had once said that, obviously it is true, that the best of men are men at best. And yes, I believe people have tried their best. 
But when Jesus comes, he will do right by all, Amen. including the poor. Look at verses 3 and 4. The mountains shall bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. Again, think with me about Saul then, who started off so good. Built that temple. And then built, a, uh, built the palace and, and then uh, did so many good things there at the beginning. Then what happened? He became a tyrant. He became an oppressor. You know, if you think about it, in, uh, of course, uh, Solomon was a king. He's a politician. How many politicians uh, talk a good game at the beginning? How many will start off even good, Right? And, uh, and, and they start off well. But listen, again, when Jesus comes to reign, the, the downhearted and the downtrodden of the earth will know it. And they will be blessed. Oh, I'm so glad that my confidence is in the king of kings, Amen. not in the earthly rulers. Now, notice the coming kingdom in verses 5 through 20. The coming king is verses 1 through 4, but the coming kingdom is in five, verses 5 through 20. When you think about this kingdom that is to come, no wonder, and when you study this out, no wonder Jesus said, we're to pray, thy kingdom come. Amen. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not been answered yet, but it will be answered, friend. Amen. Amen. God's will will be done one of these days on earth yes. as it is in heaven. Oh, and again, uh, no wonder uh, the, the song that came to my mind after studying that today. What a day that will be. Now look at verse number five. So let's talk about this coming kingdom. He says, verse five, they shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. We see in verse number five during that millennial reign of Christ that a healthy fear of God will be and throughout the whole entire kingdom. Can you imagine going everywhere and everywhere you go, you're hearing no blasphemy, Amen. no cursing, Amen. no taking God's name in vain. Amen. And everybody you meet has a healthy fear and reverence of Almighty God. I look forward to that day. Amen. Verse 6. Notice this. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass. I want us to think about that for a moment. That mown grass. You know, when Jesus comes to reign, he'll have wiped out the enemy. It's like mown grass. It's like the enemy is, and, and you know, you say, well, what's, you know, what's a big, you know, what's a big, you know, big mower in competition with this little bit of grass? Well, friend, that's not even a good contrast between our mighty God and all these world's powers. Just, amen. That's what it's going to be like. Mown grass. But hang on a second. Notice that here we see something else. He says he's going to come down like rain upon the mown grass. As showers that water the earth. Think about that. That again, the wicked will be cut down like the grass. But then the Lord is going to come upon this earth in compassion. He's going to come down on this earth and rule in grace. There's going to be, during the millennial reign of Christ, a renewing. There is going to be during the millennial reign of Christ a revitalizing. There is going to be during the millennial reign of Christ a reviving like the rain on dry ground. You see, judgment will be passed and compassion will be enthroned. And yes, the wicked will be wiped out like mown grass. But friend, he's going to come down like rain and those showers, there's going to be uh, a wonderful refreshing and reviving on this earth when Jesus reigns. Look at verse number seven. In his days shall the righteous flourish and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. You see, the wicked have been removed. The righteous remain. I want you to think about this, that war will be a thing of the past. Can you imagine there'll be three people we're about, let's, let's just use this illustration. We're 500 years in the millennial reign of Christ. You know, and there's kids about 300 years old. You know, you know, you know bounces are going to be children born during that time. And I'd be like, Dad, what's, you know, what's, 
What's, what's war? I don't know, so let's go down to the library today. Let's, let's, let's read about it. We never, yeah, I guess it's going to be peace on the earth. It's going to be amazing, all right? It's going to be a thing of the past. Righteous Jesus is going to rule with righteous people. And again, this is going to last. Aren't you glad we're not going to have elections every four years? Amen? Every faith for a thousand years, he's going to rule and reign. Hallelujah for no political ads. Glory to God. Amen. Woo! I'm fired up about that. Amen. <laughs> you know what? Even the final brief rebellion won't last at the end. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth that'll come. Look at verse 8. He shall have dominion also. Notice that he shall have dominion. Hey, listen, that dominion that God gave to Adam, Adam lost it, didn't he? But Jesus reclaimed it. And aren't you glad he ain't going to lose it? Amen. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. There's nowhere you're going to go on this earth that Jesus doesn't reign. From America to Antarctica, from Maine to California, from China to Russia to Brazil to Ethiopia, he will reign. Whew, I'll leave for that. I'm looking forward uh, to that day. He's going to have dominion, all right? And uh, again, what, Adam, what God created Adam to do and Adam failed, Jesus will do. Look at verse number nine. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him and his enemies shall lick the dust. Again, many of his enemies will already be dead. But those who uh, all will bow before him. Look at verse number 10. He says the kings of Tarshish. Now where's Tarshish? The Tarshish area prophetically represents the western world. If you read Ezekiel 38, Gog and Magog, that's the, the north region, all right? Uh, these uh, of Tarshish oppose their invasion there in Ezekiel 38. And then look at verse number 10. He talks about Sheba. Sheba represents the south. Remember the queen of Sheba, all right? Represents the south. Uh, and I, I thought about this. I don't know if I really ever thought much about it. But boy, it was a wonderful thought. Do you remember when the queen, we're talking about here the Lord's reign in, 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 in this context. Do you remember the queen of Sheba when she came? Do you remember when she thought of what she thought about Solomon? She thought there ain't no way he's that great. Remember that? And then she came, and what did she say? The half hadn't been told. I thought about that. And I thought about, you know what? We have an idea of when Jesus is going to rule and reign. And we think, wow, that is great. You know what we're going to say during the millennial reign of Christ? The half hadn't been told. <laughs> He's even better than we thought. It's even better than we thought. It's more glorious than we thought. It's going to be an amazing thing. I never know that I ever put those two and two together about how that is a type and picture of when Christ is going to rule on this earth. Putting Psalm 72.10 with that story uh, about, um, notice he says, he says, they're going to bring gifts. They're going to bring him gifts. All right? And, and, you know, hey, the queen of Sheba brought gifts, didn't she? Right? She brought gifts and all those things. All right? What a thought there uh, that is for us tonight. Look at verse 11. He says, yea, all kings. <laughs> he talked about Tarshish, talked about Sheba and Seba and all that. And, and, by, and verse 11 is just kind of like, well, and everybody else. All kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. That's what the world needs today, doesn't it? Just to fall down before Jesus. Yield to Jesus. <coughs> surrender to Jesus. Love Jesus and serve Jesus. Amen. That's going to happen. It's going to happen. He, I, like, I like that in verse uh, number 11. He says, yea, all kings. Yea, yeah, it's going to happen. Amen, it's going to happen. Look at verse 12. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth. The poor also and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence and precious shall their blood be in his sight. You know, I've, I've heard this, and you've heard this statement before as well, that a good judge of character is what people do to those who could do nothing in return. 
You ever heard that statement before? We all have, right? And, um, you know, if you want a, a, a good judge of character, because our world says, right, our world says, scratch my back, scratch your back, right? I'll do for those who can do for me and, and all those things. But think about this. When Jesus, when he came the first time, he helped the poor greatly, those who could do nothing for him. When he comes the second time, the first time he came as man, Yes, he was God, but yes, he came as man. He helped the poor greatly. The second time when he comes as monarch, he will bless the poor. That's what he's saying here in these verses, in verses 12 through 14. Again, he knew what it was like to be poor. Look at verse 14. I love verse 14. This whole message in and of itself, all these verses really. Verse 14 says, he shall redeem. Notice that word. Redeem their soul from deceit and violence and precious shall their blood be in his sight. Think about the word redeem. Think about that kinsman redeemer. Think about how that story fits us and how Ruth is a picture of every one of us. Ruth who needed redemption. She was a Moabite. She was born wrong the first time. She was destitute. She was a widow. She was a pagan. She was under the curse of the law. Friend, that's all of us. We were born wrong. We were destitute. We were poor. We were bankrupt. We were born wrong. We were under the curse. Boaz, a picture of Jesus Christ, redeemed her. He redeemed her person by marrying her. Friend, he is the groom. We are the bride of Christ. We are married to him. Amen. He redeemed her a person. He redeemed her property. She became royalty. She became rich. I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I am royalty. I am rich. It's what we have in the Lord Jesus. He says he shall redeem. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad to be redeemed tonight? Amen. Amen. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm glad to be saved. Verse 15. He says that he shall live. Notice that. He shall live. And to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually. And daily shall he be praised. He shall live. That phrase there um, has the idea of that he will live forever. Amen. Aren't you glad he's the eternal God? He's the eternal king that's going to sit on an earthly throne for a while. The world's wealth will be in his hands. The gold of Sheba, he says here in verse 15. Again, Sheba was known for its gold and its wealth. The queen of Sheba brought gold to Solomon, if you remember. Many people desire riches. Think about this. Many desire riches for selfish gain. Many desire to have all the riches for selfishness. But you think about the Lord. He will have it all, but he will use it to bless and help the whole entire world. Not selfish, but selfless. Look at verse 15. And he says, prayer also should be made for him continually. And daily shall he be praised. During the millennial reign of Christ, worship of him will be continuous and universal. Think about that. Think about going into Walmart and everybody praising God. Because there is Walmarts. Hopefully not. But I digress anyways. Anyway. Can't be heaven on earth. Let's get Walmart. But I digress. Amen. I'm teasing. But worship of him will be continuous. And universal. I mean, you can go to Russia, they're praising God. You can go to China, they'll be praising God. You can go down the street, they'll be praising God. There'll be nowhere that you go that they won't be praising God. He says that praise shall, uh, daily shall he be praised, and it will be continuous. No longer will people be worshiping sticks and stones and stuff. They'll be worshiping the Savior. Look at verse 16. Notice this. He says, there shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. That tells us that there's no poverty, just prosperity in his kingdom that's worldwide. No financial collapse in this kingdom. Oh, there may be a financial collapse in this kingdom we're living in today. Maybe heading there before we know it. But no financial collapse in this kingdom when Jesus comes to rule and reign. He says there in verse 16 that he would be a handful of corn on the top of the mountains. Think about those places that are normally desolate. 
desolate places on top of mountains. <laughs> he said, you go up the top of the mountain, there's even food there. Yeah. Well, God's just going to bless everywhere. Praise the Lord for that. Verse 17 says, his name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and man shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. The whole world is going to acknowledge the debt that they owe to the Lord Jesus Christ. They're all going to be saying, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I'll leave for that. Praise God for the Savior. Friend, praise will ring out in every city. Praise to God will raise, ring out in every town. Praise to God will ring out. I mean, just think about that. Isn't that amazing? That nowhere you're going to go, you're not going to be praising the Lord. All nations shall call him blessed. Look at verse 18. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. Verse 18 tells us, praise him because he is unique in his person. But verse 19 says, praise him because he's universally praised. Unique in his person and universally praised. Look at verse 19. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Look at that verse 19 uh, there. Um, no, verse 18, excuse me. Verse 18, notice he calls him the Lord God. Calls him the Lord God. Again, the name Jehovah. The God who keeps his word. The covenant keeping God. And then the Lord God, the God of Israel, talked about that being he's Elohim. How he's the creator. You put those two together and the world is going to see the wonders of his grace. And they're going to see the wonders of his government. The wonders of his grace and the wonders of his government. And they're going to praise him. <laughs> and we are going to praise him. Look at verse 20. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. The word ended there could mean that, again, this is most likely written when David is in old age. He's, he's, he's done, he's written his last song. He's written his last song. But the word ended it could also have this thought that it will be accomplished. God is going to do what he says. I like it both ways, don't you? Amen. That David is praising God here at the end of his life. And he says, God is going to do these things. Amen to that. Now let me give you eight things, eight commitments that I want to make from this song. And I want you to make. Number one. Focus on Christ. Focus on Christ. Get beyond Solomon and get on to Jesus. Get beyond any man or any woman. Focus on Christ. Glance at men. Gaze at God. Focus on Christ. Number two, may our performance be right. God's called you to be a dad. God's called you to be a mom. God's called you to be whatever he's called you to be. You have the title. May our performance be right. Not just our title. But may our performance be right. That was David's prayer for Solomon. He was going to have the title of king. He wanted him to be the right kind of king. May our performance be right. Number three, the third commitment we need to make from this song. Treat others right, no matter if they can do anything for you or not. Treat others right. Don't be like the world that says, scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, and I'll do as you do unto me. Treat others right. Number four, Pray for God's kingdom to come. He's told us to do so. Pray for God's kingdom to come. Number five, remember we're on the winning side. Amen. We are on the winning side. Amen. Good song tonight. Amen. Amen. Winning side. Number six, remember our great salvation. Don't ever get over being saved. Don't ever get over being saved. Remember our great salvation. Remember our redemption. Number seven, remember how it ends. Don't get so caught up in all that's going on in your life today. We know how it ends. Amen. We know we're on the winning side. We know how it ends. Don't forget that. Don't lose sight of that. And number eight, and finally, 
If it's worth doing then, it's worth doing now. What I mean by that is in the, in the context of praising God. Hey, during the millennial reign of Christ, you know what you're going to be seeing me do for a thousand years? Every, every time you see me, Brother Mike, praising God. Amen. Every time I see Brother Mike, praising God. Amen. Every time we see each other, we're going to be praising God, praising God, praising God. Hey, you know what? Let's just go ahead and have choir practice it now. Amen? Amen. Just start now. Just praise God everywhere we go. God inhabits the praises of his people. If it's worth doing then, then it's worth doing now. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads bowed and our eyes are closed this evening.